solution to that, of course, it's pretty simple. Don't eat seafood. Climate. Now, this is interesting. Um, some uh, recent research here says that we are now at tipping points. Uh, interesting, not bad, not good, rather. We are now, we've now reached tipping points on uh, a number of areas around the world. A lot of them are related to ice and snow. But these tipping points, you see, the world's predictions on temperature for the future, this is all based on um, linear models. You, you look at uh, these, these are the these are the models that say, okay, what are our emissions going to be, and therefore, what's the future temperature and climate going to be? And none none of those models is based on nonlinear um, uh, uh, changes. And when we hit tipping points, we get a nonlinear change. So what this is saying is that. We're about to hit, or we are hitting now, the points where we have an unknown future. The, the models are not just going to describe the future we, we're getting ourselves into. So even at 1.1 degree global warming average, we have a, such a, 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 a difficult future ahead of us. It's, it's, uh, I, I'm the father of six grandchildren, and I fear for their future. I know the solution, but I fear for their future. And the face of climate change is what I mentioned before with water. It's refugees. If you are a Syrian farmer who year after year you have the millennium drought and then another year of drought and you have no food to feed the family, you can't rely on, on the government. Uh, there's, there's no social security there. You must get up and walk and go to Europe. That's the place to go. So um, it's been pro projected that we'll have 150 million climate refugees by 2050. As I say, most of them within the same continent. But this is going to cause frictions and uh, all sorts of problems for the future. Now, we know that food will cause one and a half to two degrees global warming, even if we cut carbon dioxide to zero. Did you get that? So food alone will cause more dangerous global warming, let alone fossil fuels, let alone anything else. Um, so so that, that single point there must make us sit up and think about food. But no, you're not coming for my hamburger. We've got to change that or we won't survive. Okay. Um, uh, I've got this a little bit out of order, but um, uh, this is a map. We'll come back to this. This is a map of the, um, the the world's grazing pastures and the amount of vegetation and therefore carbon on those pastures. And if we rewilded those pastures, we could soak down as much uh, carbon dioxide as, as the fossil fuels have all released. So the solution to climate change, it, it's also the lowest cost, largest scale climate fix we have. And it's rewilding grazing lands. We'll, we'll get to this, uh, why this is important in a minute. Uh, this was just a, a picture from the Australian bushfires. They were, they were scary. So, um, this is a, a piece of new research that's just come out uh, about six months ago um, that, that's blowing our understanding or in, in increasing our understanding of climate change dramatically. Now, if you were to ask anyone on the street or even think yourself, what's the leading cause of climate change? Most people would say it's carbon dioxide and it's fossil fuels. Well, not true. Um, and the reason for that is that when we burn fossil fuels, we release carbon dioxide, which warms the planet, but we also release sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides and other aer aerosols that cool the planet. So um, we have this, this, this struggle 
between warming and cooling um, of, of when we burn fossil fuels. The, the, the father of uh, climate science, James Hansen, he called this the Faustian bargain, the deal with the devil. If we stop burning fossil fuels altogether, the, the, the aerosols that cause the cooling will leave the atmosphere fairly quickly, but the carbon dioxide will stay up there for, for lo longer. So, so the, the point of that is that the warming from carbon dioxide up until now has been almost, almost masked totally by the cooling from these aerosols. So the net warming from fossil fuels, including methane escaped, has been just 20% of global warming. I'll repeat that, that up until now, actually 2015, the warming from fossil fuels has caused 20% of global warming. What's caused half global warming is methane. Okay, so that fact alone, if that were factored into policy, that should change dramatically how we think about emissions. Because up until now, fossil fuels haven't been the baddie we thought they were. It's methane is the baddie. And we all know the greatest uh, source of methane, it's animals. So, so there's the problem. We need to recalibrate that thinking. And most of the 20% that's due to fossil fuels is actually the methane component of leaks from coal mines and fracking, that sort of thing. So the, this is the new science that's absolutely sitting a lot of people on their hind legs, and um, it's too much for most people. They, they're not even talking about it. And if you look further back, if you look further back in time to when we started deforesting with our stone axes and fire, um, we've, we've, we've stripped the world of half its forest and degraded a lot of the rest. And the emissions from that are actually, in, in cumulative, are, are actually greater than the cumulative emissions from fossil fuels. So um, if you look at um, what's causing global warming to date, methane's the big one. We know where that comes from. And the other unconstrained carbon dioxide comes from deforestation. It's not constrained by uh, aerosols, uh, cooling. So, so agriculture, uh, particularly animal agriculture, has been the leading cause of, um, of climate change. And as we saw a few slides back, if we revegetate, if we rewild those areas of the world that um, that, that are now grazing lands that used to be forest, then we can reverse, effectively, reverse climate change. So the, the power of food in changing our planet back to a habitable planet is extreme. It's extraordinary. And when we look at all of the, um, uh, all of the studies that look at what's, what's our way out of this climate change mess, what are the solutions? All of them have forests and, and reforestation, afforestation at the very top of the list. You can, you can see this is natural climate solutions. It's one of many. There's, there's others called Project Drawdown and there's a lot of other studies. But um, you can see from this that forest reforestation is number one. Now, this scale goes from zero up to four there. but but this, and it's broken, and this is 10. So way off, off on the right of this chart is, is the effectiveness of, of reforestation. So it's the number one solution. And people, we, we know this, climate scientists know this. By long shot, that's the number one solution. <clears throat> um, the other I'll bring your attention to is that uh, grazing animal management, grazing optimi optimization, and grazing leg legumes, these solutions are right down here. So they're tiny in comparison 
to forests. Forests are the main game. We will come to see in the future that every tree is so precious. And why is this so effective? Why is it that um, food is so, so effective? Well, this is it right here. It's land use. It sounds uh, rather boring, but it's so powerful. This is an IPCC group diagram of what we do with our planet. Um, you can see that the infrastructure, the built up areas in pink on the left hand top, that's just 1% of the planet. So even though this is where we live, all we see is roads and railways and houses and, and bridges and, and airports and, and, and cities. This is all we see, but that's only 1% of the planet. So not very powerful in terms of uh, vegetation. Um, you see that the next area, which is 12% of the planet, is cropland. 2% of, of, of the planet is irrigated. The rest is non-irrigated. So we rely on non-irrigated cropland greatly. In green here, the largest land use on Earth is grazing land. The largest land use on Earth. And we still have 22% of the, of the Earth that is uh, forest. About 12% of that is untouched uh, or not dramatically altered, but most of it is altered. And then we've got the area that we don't use. So if you if you were manager of this land, if this was your island, say, and you were manager of it, you could see now that tweaking land use on the single largest land use would have way more effect than tweaking land use, for example, growing trees in cities. In his recent book, George, uh, Regenesis, George Monbiot says that if aliens were to visit the UK, they would think that the dominant life form was sheep. Now, that's a bit of a joke, but um, <laughs> it's obvious when you, when you look at this land use, what do we give away our precious planet to? Most of it we give away to grazing animals. And uh, uh, half of this, a big chunk of this, is given away to uh, feedlot animals. But the most of all is grazing animals. Now, I would think that wouldn't it be better to give it to people rather than animals? So George Monbiot is right. And from that uh, grass-fed area, from that grazing area, we get, it, which, which corresponds to 37% of the land, we get 5% of our protein. That's all, just 5% of our protein. Now, isn't that a gross waste when we know that repurposing, rewilding that land can effectively solve the biodiversity crisis, solve the climate crisis? Um, there's a lot of literature now on the amount of carbon dioxide that could be soaked down. Uh, most of them look at uh, realistic solutions um, but some of them now are deliberately uh, modelling uh, the vegan diet, and the, the numbers are huge. They, they're using all sorts of deter terms to describe this. They, they're using opportunity cost, carbon opportunity cost, uh, double climate dividend, uh, many different terms. But it's removing grazed animals off the land to rewild that land. <laughs> Pardon me. So if we remove grazed animals from our diet, red meat and dairy gone, we would reduce methane emissions by at least a third. We'd slow global warming by at least two decades and half a degree. We would draw down all the, the fossil fuel emissions and the, the, the ongoing deforestation would all but cease. 80% of that would stop. This is a powerful, powerful solution. <laughs> we just got to uh, get it, let it sink through. Now, this is some work I did when I was looking at regenerative grazing or regenerative ranching. Um, the, 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 I, I think here it's a, it's a case of... Uh, um, uh, 
bias, just simple, um, uh, simple bias. This here on the left hand side, this this blue bar that you can barely see here, that is the full potential of restoring all the world's grazing lands to optimal to their prime previous condition. So it's equivalent to one to two percent of global emissions. It's it's minuscule. It's tiny. Um, this this next bar is the crop soil reparation. If we were to restore all the world's crop soils to their pristine condition, this is how much carbon we could soak down. So what that shows you is that even though the croplands are a much smaller area, they've lost a lot more carbon than the grazing lands have lost. So that's where we've, we've turned the soil, we've oxidised the carbon, which carbon starts with plants, of course, goes into the soil. When we disturb the soil, it's oxidised and it's, and it's, uh, it's eroded. Um, and and the third bar here is the the uh, potential if we restore the forests on the world's grazing lands, just the forest areas, which is less than half of of those grazing lands, we will effectively reverse global warming. And then I did a, a thought experiment. Okay, what if we what if we rewild all the world's cities? Because the cities are built on rivers, they 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 must have been big forests there originally, and that's been studied now. <laughs> and here it is. That's that's the bar that if we rewild all the world cities, we'll get this amount of uh, carbon drawdown. But in comparison to the carbon drawdown, if we rewild the world's grazing lands, it's it's also insignificant. So meat and fish consumption is the biggest threat to wildlife. It's the greatest cause of forest destruction. It's the biggest threat to water cycles. It's the greatest threat to oceans. It's the greatest cause of climate change. And this is one of many studies that have been produced saying, okay, what is sustainable? What, what level of meat consumption is sustainable? And the WWF have uh, run these sums and they say that meat consumption must fall by set by three quarters globally, which means more than 90% in the meat heavy West. So this is how the USA is that blue bar right at the top. That's their meat consumption now. And oops, and that's their meat consumption as it needs to be to, to hit sustainability. <clears throat> And they're saying this needs to be done by 2030. So this is an urgent message. And what we need to do basically is rethink how we use our land. If we rewild grazing lands, which is half the land we use, we'll solve the biodiversity crisis, the climate crisis, the deforestation crisis, and the water cycles. But it requires diet change. There's a wealth of science on this, in, on this now. Okay, what is sustainable consumption? Well, for climate, red meat and dairy go. For biodiversity loss, we need to get rid of all meat. For water security, we must cut down three quarters of the meat. For deforestation, we need to replace half to 93% of the meat. For nitrogen pollution, we need to replace at least half the meat and dairy. For zoonotic diseases, we must replace all the meat, stop pressuring nature. For ocean, ocean ecosystem health, we must replace seafood with, uh, with others, with plant foods. And for human health, we need to replace 50% of the red meat and sugar. So this is what the science is telling us. This is not me pulling it out of the top of my head. We've got to dramatically change. And we know that without livestock to feed, we would have a 50% surplus of food. <laughs>